Hello my YouTube friends and welcome back to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video. Today I'm going to be looking at the Polk Monitor XT20. This is a bookshelf model, retails for $299.99 and it includes a 6.5 inch woofer plus a 1 inch soft dome tweeter. So today we're going to look at the TS parameters of both drivers, we're going to look at the construction quality of the cabinet, we're going to look at the crossover components and then we're going to see what the port tuning is on this bookshelf speaker. So if that interests you, stay tuned. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the woofer. It's held in by four 3 millimeter Allen screws. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is not your typical mounting frame on a, on a driver. Normally they're circular in shape and they have screws all the way around. And one of the observations that I've uh, made by doing teardowns on budget speakers is I've noticed that when speakers utilize a mounting frame like this, they're typically reserved just for budget friendly speakers. So, you know, I really don't know what to expect out of this driver. We won't know until we get it removed and on the bench and measured, but uh, I'm hoping Polk proves me wrong. I'm hoping that they didn't cheap out. So let's get this thing removed and uh, let's find out. I'm happy to report that Polk is using a pretty nice driver for this price point. Polk is using quite a bit of tech for this driver for such an affordable line. The driver has a stamped steel basket, a 1 inch overhung boys coil, and is using a vented bobbin to vent the trapped air behind the dust cap during long strokes. Polk is also venting the voice coil underneath the spider. This will help keep the voice coil cool during those long and loud listening sessions. The woofer utilizes a butyl rubber surround and the comb material is made from polypropylene mixed with what feels like a paper material on the back side of the cone. Polypropylene is just another name for plastic. The motor structure is pretty beefy for this price point too. Polk is using a pretty large ferrite magnet plus an additional bucking magnet for the woofer. Bucking magnets used to be quite the rarity but I have come across quite a few of them lately. Heiko and Sirwin Vega are also using woofers that utilize bucking magnets too. Bucking magnets were a big thing in the 80s and 90s because they cancel out the magnetic field from the main magnet, which allows the speaker to be placed next to a tube TV without interfering with it. I have read that bucking magnets can help increase the sensitivity of the driver as well as lowering total Q. Now let's put this speaker on the bench and see how it measures. Before I put it on the bench, let's do a quick excursion test. The mid-bass driver measured pretty good on my bench, especially considering how affordable these speakers are. This driver has a resonant frequency of 50 Hz and also has a pretty low inductance value of 0.35 millihenries. Inductance is also an important variable to pay attention to because higher inductance drivers can be a major source of harmonic distortion. Speaker Q is another important variable to look at because it will tell us how strong this motor and magnet system are for a given driver. A driver with a low QTS of 0.2 would have a large magnet and can move the cone with a lot of force versus a driver with a higher QTS value. Think of QTS this way. Low values of QTS will give tight and punchy sound with good transients, but at the expense of low bass output. High QTS values will have higher lower frequency output, but at the expense of slower transient response. The driver from the XT20 has a QTS value of 0.5013 which is pretty decent for this price point. A general rule of thumb for determining the suitability of a driver in a sealed or vented enclosure is efficiency bandwidth product. By calculating this variable, it will give us an idea if this driver is better suited for a sealed enclosure or a ported enclosure, or either or. 
You can calculate this variable by taking the resonant frequency of the driver and dividing it by QES. The woofer from the XT20 has an EBP of 95, which is at the top of the range for being used in a sealed or ported enclosure. I can see why Polk is using a vented enclosure for the XT20 judging by the high EBP variable. In my opinion, this is a very respectable driver for this price point. Nice job, Polk. The driver from the XT20 weighs 3 pounds and 2.8 ounces on my scale. For comparison, the driver from my Serwin Vega LA165 weighs 2 pounds and 5.2 ounces, and the driver from my Heiko Aurora 700s came in at 2 pounds and 9.1 ounces. So the woofer out of the XT20 measured pretty well. I love the fact that the inductance value is reasonably low and also that the woofer is well damped judging by the Q factor. Now let's remove the tweeter and see how that thing measures. The tweeter assembly is held in by these four 3mm Allen screws and it's actually a pretty large assembly that appears to have kind of a built in waveguide here. So this should come out pretty easily. In my opinion, the tweeter out of the XT20 is pretty average for this price point. Polk is using a pretty beefy motor structure that has a pretty good sized ferrite magnet plus an additional bucking magnet. The waveguide for the tweeter is made out of plastic and is about 3 16 of an inch thick. For a comparison, the waveguide from the XT20 is just a tad thinner than the one I removed from my Serwin Vega LA165 which came in at a quarter of an inch thick. The tweeter dome from the XT20 is made from terralene, or I think that's how you pronounce it. I will admit I wasn't familiar with this material until I started doing some research and realized that terralene is just a fancy name for polyester. Polyester is a kind of plastic that is derived from petroleum. In my opinion, the tweeter sounded okay and the performance is similar to others in this price point. Now let's get it on the bench and see how it measures. Well, this is a first. I had some problems retrieving the TS parameters from the tweeter using my Dayton Audio DATS V3 system. I reached out to Parts Express to get an explanation on what was going on and why my DATS system could not read the TS parameters from my Polk tweeter. And this is what they told me. They basically said the inductive rise in the tweeter's frequency response is what is causing the equation to break, and because of this, DATS is unable to calculate the parameters. They said that the shallower than usual trough above the resident peak prior to inductive rise appears to be causing this erroneous behavior. If this tweeter had a greater resonant peak provided by greater QMS as well as reduced voice coil inductance then this error would never happen. He did go on to say that if I created a Zobel network to address the rise in inductance then I could retrieve the TS parameters from this tweeter but I didn't have the parts on hand to assemble one. Because of this, these are the only parameters that I was able to retrieve, and from the sounds of it, they might not even be accurate. Now let's take a look at the terminal cup to see if they're using any ferromagnetic parts in the signal path. The terminal cup is just held in by four Phillips head screws, so it should be pretty easy to remove. So this is the terminal cup that I pulled from the Polk Monitor XT20 and it actually has the crossover attached right to it. First let's take a look at these binding posts and see if we have any ferromagnetic materials being used. Oh that's great, we have nothing there. Awesome. And then we have these little tabs that go from the binding post and they lead into the crossover here. And I don't believe those are made out of steel either. They're not magnetic. But the nuts that fasten the binding post to the terminal cup, the ones that are colored in red, they are made out of steel. And these could be replaced very easily with ones made out of brass. And I'll leave a link in the description to some brass nuts if you'd like to replace them. The crossover being used on the XT20 is your no-frills crossover that is typically found in budget speakers. As you can see, Polk is using electrolytic caps on the tweeter circuit, which are not the best at preserving sound quality. In my opinion, upgrading the caps on the tweeter circuit from electrolytic to MKP caps would improve the sound quality significantly. I really like the woofer from the XT20 and think it's pretty nice for this price point. 
It's too bad these drivers are crippled by the poor crossover components. For comparison, here's the crossover from a pair of $270 Serwin Vega LA165 bookshelf speakers. Serwin Vega has produced a really nice quality crossover for this price point, and they are also using polycaps on the tweeter circuit. In my opinion, the woofer from the LA165 isn't as nice as the woofer being used on the Polk, but they make up for it by giving their speaker a great crossover and cabinet. As you can see, there are a lot of concessions that have to be made in order to design an affordable bookshelf that meets a certain price point. Cabinet construction on the Polk Monitor XT20 is pretty typical for what I see at this price point. The front baffle is using 5 8 inch thick MDF and the rear cabinet wall is made from half inch thick MDF. I assume the sides of the cabinet walls are also using half inch MDF. There is no internal bracing and damping material is sparse and is only installed behind the tweeter. When Polk was cutting out the hole for the woofer on the front baffle, they used the leftover material from that cut to stiffen the upper cabinet wall with. I thought that was a brilliant use of leftover material that otherwise would have been thrown out. When I was performing the knock test on this cabinet, I could definitely tell a difference between the top of the cabinet and the sides of the cabinet. The sides of the cabinet sounded pretty hollow and would ring quite a bit whereas the top of the cabinet was pretty quiet. No doubt this cabinet would benefit from some damping material like Sonic Barrier being applied to the inside walls to help reduce resonances. Again, this type of construction quality isn't out of the ordinary for this price point and is one of the reasons why these speakers are so affordable. The finish on the Polk Monitor XT20 reminds me a lot of the coating that is used to line truck beds with. I really like the finish, and it appears to be really durable and scratch resistant too. Cabinet appearance is also a very subjective topic, so a person will have to decide for themselves if it's right for their decor or not. But I think it's pretty cool and industrial looking. Nice job, Polk! Polk claims the Monitor XT20 has a frequency response from 38Hz to 40,000Hz. The 40,000 Hz extension is a bit of a marketing gimmick because humans can't hear above 20,000 Hz anyways. I also think Polk is being a bit optimistic claiming their XT20 can go down to 38 Hz, judging by the resonant frequency of the driver and port tuning of the enclosure. The reason I say this is because port tuning came in at 49 Hz, which is pretty far from their 38 Hz claim. Remember how I said this speaker could benefit from more damping inside the enclosure? Well, I performed a second test. On this test, I stuffed the enclosure with 92 grams worth of polyfill and got a dramatic improvement in quality factor as well as bass response. Port tuning with the polyfill went from 49 Hz down to 46 Hz and quality factor went from 1.326 to 1.082. That's impressive results from a $25 investment in polyfill. I'll leave links in the description to the polyfill that I used if you'd like to purchase some for your speakers. And that's my look inside video of the Polk Monitor XT20. Hopefully this video will give you an idea of what to expect from a set of $300 speakers from Polk Audio. In my opinion, Polk created a pretty competitive speaker for this price category. Some of the things that I really like about these speakers are the mid-range driver, the speaker binding posts, and the finish on the cabinet. My only gripe with these speakers is I think Polk should have stuffed the cabinet with a bit more polyfill. Thankfully, adding some additional polyfill is a very easy and affordable upgrade to do on your own. If you'd like to know my opinion on how the Monitor XT20 sounds, then check out my review video, which will be out next month. If you enjoy watching these look inside videos that I do, then make sure to hit the like button. I treat likes as votes on what videos I should do more of next. Until then, so long and happy listening.